Thank you, Senator Lionhelm. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on this bill because it is important. Um, in fact, I made some comments in my maiden speech in this place uh, around what are those things about democracy that are worth defending. And it's not so much um, the benefits, uh, it's about those principles, those things that underpin a plural, liberal, secular democracy uh, and freedom of speech, uh, thought, association, all those things are part of it, and that's why it's important. Now, this debate uh, is problematic from the point of view of the examples that are often given by those who wish to keep ANC as it is. Often go to the personal interactions between people, and uh, there have been not only in the chamber here but in committee hearings. Uh, some very distressing stories told about the personal interactions between people uh, who are harassing or intimidating people on the basis of their race. And there is no one in this place who would find that acceptable. I think it's fair to say, and let me be clear, nobody wants to see someone harassed on the basis of the colour of their skin. But nor should anyone here want to see a cartoonist harassed by a government authority for expressing a view. Now, the difference between those two cases is that on one hand you have a fairly clear, directed, personal attack on somebody that is intimidating or harassing, bearing in mind the definition of harassment in this bill uh, means that it can be a one-off event. And it's not the circular argument that some people have pointed to with other definitions of harassment. So the government's actually strengthening against that individual case. And as I said, to be clear, nobody supports that. But the problem with the other case in the more general public statement is that there is no clear threshold, there is no predictor that somebody can use as to what that threshold of offence is is. And so I think it's really instructional when we look at this broader type of statement to look at the Bill Bleak case because it is a fantastic exemplar of this in action. When we have heard submissions in the inquiry around 18C and how it should be interpreted, people have said, look, you can't have the reasonable person test because you haven't walked in that person's shoes. You haven't understood what they've gone through. And that's a fair argument from one perspective. But in this case, what we saw was some people, and Senator Back just referred to it before, people from the Aboriginal Legal Service going out and encouraging people to say, look, you know, don't you find that offensive? We should take some action over this. So there is one threshold that people have taken offence. But then you have people like Mr Mundine, who wrote a very good article in the press which highlighted his background, highlighted the fact that he was one of the Indigenous population group. His background was not a privileged background. He had experienced all kinds of actions, and yet he, as a member of that people group, made the very clear statement that some people see racism where there is none, referring to Bill Leake's cartoon. And that identifies a very clear difference between that personal one-on-one -on -one incident of harassment or intimidation and a case where somebody is expressing a view and there is no clear threshold at the moment, no predictor of threshold for me to understand or for Bill Leake to understand, am I going to get the Aboriginal Legal Services response or am I going to get Warren Mundine's response? And that's not an acceptable place for our society to be in because it means that the intent, the purpose of an expression is judged lawful or unlawful on the unquantifiable response of even one other individual who may choose to say, I take offence at that. We saw that in the, uh, the case with the QUT students and often where difficult subjects come up, where subjects that people feel personally and they may well have had experiences in their past that are painful and disturbing. They will choose to respond in certain ways, but 
if one of the fundamental parts of our democracy is that people can speak about difficult topics, we need to allow for the fact that not everybody will have the training of a lawyer, not everyone will have the opportunity to research case history before exercising that right. In fact, to quote Justice Kirby, in his judgment in the decision of the High Court in 2004 of Coleman versus Power, this is what Justice Kirby said, and I quote, in Australia, we tolerate robust public expression and opinions because it's part of our freedom. And it's inherent in the constitutional system of a representative democracy. That system requires freedom of communication. It belongs as much to the obsessive, the emotional and the inarticulate as it does to the logical, the cerebral and the restrained." End quote. Those are not my words. That's Justice Kirby. And it highlights the fact that people, when they enter into this debate around ideas, may not have the background to understand all the jurisprudence around what has or hasn't been accepted in the past for 18C, the high legal standard that we're constantly told uh, is applied to 18C. And part of the problem, as we saw for both the QUT case and for Mr Leake, and undisclosed names, but the reports from the Human Rights Commission identify for many hundreds of other people who have ended up paying in the order of hundreds of thousands, nearly a million dollars uh, in these processes. The process when somebody says, I'm offended and goes to the Human Rights Commission, the process itself is debilitating and punishing even if things don't get to the court. And so we need to look at how we word this piece of legislation that protects the individuals and in all those cases we've heard, and the government is actually strengthening this so that we do protect people from that harassment or that intimidation, but we provide a platform, an ability for people who want to contribute into the public debate in good faith to not be hauled up before a state authority because one person or a group of people, in the words of Warren Mundine, see racism where it is not. Now, it's important that we resolve this now because, as we've seen in the media just in the last week, uh, there have already been discussions uh, by the opposition about how this potentially should apply not just to the Racial Discrimination Act, but this 18C construct should apply more broadly, whether it be in religion or sexuality or other areas. And so when we look at the reluctance of sections of our community now, in the absence of any law, to be intolerant of views that differ to their own, I shudder to think of the consequences if this was wrapped up in a law and a process that is similar to Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. So let's take another very current example, the uh, debate that was on a Bible Society video uh, where people were drinking a Cooper's beer. Now, I've watched that. I know both of the gentlemen concerned. And the debate was civil. It was informed. You could even say it was innocuous, except that in the current climate, it was challenging. It was challenging because what it said is that despite the rhetoric of the progressive left that anyone who doesn't agree with their view is a hateful bigot, what it demonstrated was that people of good character and goodwill can have differing points of view and discuss it in a civil way. And what that does is it said both of those people have worth. Their views have a place in our society. And our society, if it is to function as a plural, liberal, secular democracy must allow people to discuss and debate ideas in that format. But what happened, Mr Deputy President? We saw outrage on social media. We saw people boycotting the products of Coopers, who were by and large the innocent party in this whole affair. And so damage was done on people, in this case a company, 
by people who were intolerant of ideas that differed to theirs. And so if we already see under section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act people seeing racism where there is none, and we see in cases like this people seeing bigotry and hatred where there is none, demonstrably none, then I shudder to think of adding the weight of law to that. Likewise, uh, the case of Mark Allaby, an employee of IBM, who was singled out by activists who questioned why he should be allowed to work for a firm that was an avowed supporter of diversity and equity and marriage equality, and that's fine. They're quite entitled to do that if they wish. But this person was singled out on the basis of his association with a group that was looking to raise up and train articulate contributors to our society. If you actually look at the Macquarie, Lock and Macquarie Institute and you look at what they're about, they're about training people to participate in an articulate and informed way into the debates of our society, into our culture, not to dominate it, not to impose their views on others, but to contribute, to see where their world view has a place. And if you look at the people who are on the board of that institute, um, you don't see people who you would characterise uh, in any negative terms. There are people there who have been committed to a number of years to relieving global poverty, who are involved in microfinancing initiatives for people uh, in developing countries. We see people who are concerned about housing availability for the least um, able to obtain housing in our community. We see people who are committed to preventing um, modern slavery and trafficking of people. We see people who have served their country in the Defence Force for over 30 years. Uh, these are quality people who have contributed to our society, uh, to the poor, to the global good. And yet the way that they are labelled by the left, you would assume that they are the worst of worst people and why would IBM want one of them on its board? And in fact the person who started off that um, diatribe against him and as I understand it has resulted in Mr Alby having to stand down from the board of uh, Lock Macquarie Institute uh, said this is not about freedom of religion, he can have his belief, he can go to church. But if you look at Article 23 of the ICCPR, the non-derogable right of that person is to not only have his belief or his faith or his conscientious thought, but unless there is a competing right, which in this case there is not, he is also free to express it, to manifest it, to teach it. Article 22 also guarantees the freedom of association. And so Mr Albee is quite free and we should be backing him to the hilt about his freedom of association, well, particularly with a group where other board members have such uh, high standards and records of ethical contribution to our society and to the, the population and the world more broadly. And I draw, I think it's important as we we look at that, that we come to the, the statement that was issued just recently uh, around our shared values when it comes to multiculturalism. And this is something issued by the government, but the, the opposition has lent its support and said that it's a positive document. And under the parts of freedoms, it says, we support freedom of thought, speech, religion, enterprise and association. And so for those detractors of Mr Allaby, they should realise that his ability to have his faith, to associate with a group that is a positive group developing people's character and ability to contribute to our society, he has a right to do that. And that right should never be undermined. And we need national leadership, both from this parliament, but I would argue even in the business place, to support people like him. Rather than remaining silent, I'd like to see the CEOs of those companies. They write letters on other topics, and that's, you know, you can argue whether or not they should be, but they do, and they have a right to do that. 
but they should also be out supporting these fundamental rights. It's interesting, if I actually look at um, IBM's equity and diversity statement, and I'm quoting here from it, it says, a key element in our workforce diversity program is IBM's long-standing commitment to equal opportunity. Business activities such as hiring, promotion and compensation of employees are conducted without regard to gender, race, religion, gender identity or expression, sexual orientation, national origin, genetics, disability or age. And they go on to say IBMers around the world work in an environment where diversity, including diversity of thought, is the norm and innovation can flourish." End quote. So what the activists are demanding and what it appears IBM in this case have acquiesced to is to say, no, we will have a workplace with no diversity of thought. We will not allow people to have any opinion on this topic and perhaps other topics that deviates from the norm that the company has established. That's not diversity. If they want diversity and the innovation that they say will flourish through diversity, then they should need to live that out. All corporates do. All members of this place should recognise that diversity is important. I've stood here before and put forward my view on contentious topics in a polite, respectful way, with no hatred, but I've been called a hater and a bigot uh, in this place. And that, to my mind, says that people don't actually understand what diversity and equality mean. They don't understand the very nature of a liberal, plural, secular democracy where people should be free to actually do what our uh, new statement around multiculturalism says, which is that we support freedom of thought, speech, religion, enterprise and association. So to my mind, national leadership on this is required and the government is seeking to do that through these reforms. The reforms provide that leadership in terms of the wording of Section 18C to strengthen that case that we talked about at the start, where individuals are one-on-one -on -one harassed or intimidated. We're strengthening that because currently there is no protection for harassment. And that was the original wording. This all started back in 1995. That was the recommendation. The recommendation was that 18C or well, the Racial Discrimination Act, should prevent harassment. And so the government is strengthening this provision by putting that in. But we're also strengthening the freedom of thought and speech uh, in this nation, particularly at those areas where people are expressing a view and we're recognising the fact that even within a subpopulation group, you will get the diversity of people like the Aboriginal Legal Service of WA, and Mr Warren Mundine. And who is to judge in this place which of those two is right? And if Mr Mundine says others see racism where there is none but he sees none, why should we say he is wrong? And so without that predictable threshold we need to change that word. We also need to change for a similar reason that the basis upon which the judgment is made and that's why the government is looking at the reasonable person which is common across pretty much all of our other uh, statutes in that we look at what would a reasonable member of the Australian population think. That's why juries are chosen at random to be brought in. So we have a cross-section of ordinary Australians who come in to apply their judgment to a certain conduct and evidence uh, that goes before them. And lastly, because the process itself uh, has often been the punishment uh, for people. This legislation also looks at changing the process of making complaints at the Human Rights Commission. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is an important issue because we need to protect the individuals. As I said at the outset, let me be clear. Nobody in this place should, and I would argue does, support that kind of harassment or intimidation of an individual. But likewise, nobody in this place, the centre of Australia's democracy, should support situations where we cannot discuss freely in society put forward views without a government-funded authority being used as a threat to shut down that discussion. This government 
It's taking national leadership in this space. I would encourage corporates and other people to take leadership to support those people uh, within their workplace to have true diversity, freedom of speech and association.